the managers want to move to that extreme because pump ever money supply and now it's negative so mm-hmm. follow the money this inflation is happening everywhere fact the point the fact that's really scary about it is it leads me to this severe the most severe economic resets of our lifetime mike welcome to the show and thank you so much for making some time thank you ryan thanks for having me so as we were talking offline i heard you on another podcast and they did the round table what everybody was expecting for the next 12 months in the economy yeah. And nobody really wanted to take a you know a clear stance and say, hey, this is what I think will happen and this is how I'm positioning myself. But then it came to you and you said, I think we're shaping up for an absolute train wreck. So I was like, you know what? I have to have Mike on the show yeah. to pick your brain. But before we dive into your macro outlook, Mike, how did you get involved in financial markets? Uh, I've always been interested since I was a young kid. My mom said when I was a kid, I had a picture in New York and my in my room and I'm from Chicago, suburbs of in the city, but I did undergrad and I got my first job at Chicago Board of Trade um, because partly because I lived 20 miles, 30 miles south of Chicago Board of Trade. I'm like, okay, well, that's cool. And I don't didn't want to work at a desk. I'm like, market, so that's cool. And essentially been in the business since the mid 80s and um, just kind of got addicted to it. And so far, so good. I'm one of the few who survived trading pits. Most of those people just didn't, they moved on to other businesses or other things. So you have a very unique view that you're actually calling for deflation, where a lot of the uh, macro um, forecasters out there are calling for inflation to reaccelerate from here. So in your opinion, Mike, what are those forecasters missing? And what are you really keeping an eye on to back up the deflationary call? So let's start with what's happening. We are in this most significant deflationary period in the history of the producer price index since 1948. It's dropped from about 18 to minus three. So that's 21%. It's never dropped that far that fast ever. It's negative at the moment. That's a year over year. So deflation is happening in the US by that measure. It's a high beta measure of CPI. It's basically about a two beta. And it's happening in China, the world's most significant demand pull engine of growth in Asia for no, most notably about the last two decades. So it's happening. But the bottom line for all inflation is what Milton Friedman says. And we had one of the best, we've had the best example ever of liquidity, excessive liquidity, pumping inflation, and now we're in the middle of the dump. So it's the basics of economics. It's the basics of history. It's the basics of what every lesson we've learned in, in the history of asset prices that pump and liquidity that dump. So Deflation is happening in PPI, fact. Disinflation is happening everywhere, fact. The, point, the fact that's really scary about it is it leads me to this severe, the most severe economic resets of our lifetimes. And by lifetimes, I see a typical person who lives around 80, if we're lucky. Um, I mean, I didn't live through the Great Depression, but I've read about it, and we all know mm-hmm. about it, is um, the fact that most central banks led by the Fed, are still tightening. Now, we're, we're taping this on Monday, 9-11, a significant day for me. I can dig into that a little bit. Lost a lot of good friends that day. was a few blocks away. Um, that's why I'm in Miami now. But um, that's why I appreciate being on. It's bringing back memories. But these things are historic, unprecedented, and you have to just, as, as uh, Albert Einstein said once, is, yeah, the questions are the same, but the answers have changed. You have to throw away the answers of what's happened in the past, which a lot of analysts do based on their models and focus on what really has happened and where we're happening and where we're going. So that's to me is the foundation is rightly so, maybe excessively had this biggest pump in liquidity bar none in the history of mankind. Just look at US money supply up 40%. Um, mm-hmm. That was to the peak in 21, 22. And then of course, all the money the US threw at people and, and of course in Europe, not so much of that in uh, in China. And now we're dumping. There's only a few examples of that in the history. I like to go back to the period in the 20s in the US. Obviously, I'm a Yank. It's happened here. It was kind of the lead. And the Fed helped spike that pump. And as revolutionary technologies took over, what was a revolutionary technology this time? A lot of it was cryptos, AI kicking in. But we're in the dump phase now. But there was a good reason for that pump. We, a lot of people, we didn't know if we were going to live. We, you know, three years ago, a lot of people thought we were, a lot of people know, but we knew all new people who died. Yet we got vaccines and vaccines rather rapidly. Where did we do that? In the countries that have a significant rule of law and capitalist checks and balances. Who really failed? China. I mean, okay, they're catching up. But that to me was a big separation. And then you add to that, we had this mm-hmm. war. 
kick in? And why didn't the war come on the back of a significant autocratic regime, second largest economy in the world that grew so far, so fast, just like Japan did until it peaked in 89 and collapsed, and then collapsed. It's the same GDP since then. Nikkei collapsed. Um, but switched to an autocratic rule. And who did they cozy up with? The former great enemy of, of, of freedom in the US and North America, Russia. Okay, it was a Soviet Union then, but it's just epic historic. So what does mm -hmm. it come out of that? To me, is what's coming out of this is just the normal flows of markets, the normal pullback of capitalism and free markets from President Xi of China and President Putin of Russia. And now we have significant threats of nuclear activity from the leader of that former um, adversary. I mean, this wasn't even that bad during the Cold War, which I remember duck and cover. So do you think all those factors you mentioned there, a war that wasn't, uh, nobody forecasted, and then the supply shock, and because there's been a lot of smart individuals who have been calling for a recession for quite some time, but it has yes. taken a lot longer than a lot of people have thought to play Guilty. out. <laughs> what, why do you think that is? Is it just a confluence of all those factors adding up or is there other stuff going on behind the scenes? Well, that's part of predicting the future. It can be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but number one thing for someone like me to do is admit where you're wrong, stop yourself out, move on and be the best strategist you can. I was wrong. I never thought the Fed would raise high rates this much. There's good reason for it. The, the U.S. economy has been resilient, part of because this significant dichotomy between pretty significant pump in fiscal stimulus. Some people have estimated up to three trillion, which is around three ten percent of GDP. Mm -hmm. um, the we had the banking crisis and we just solved that instantly, just threw money at it and solved it. Um, mm -hmm. The the point just there's so much fiscal stimulus, and the problem is it's being offset by monetary restraint. Um, and it's also the simple fact of the, so much liquidity was thrown into the system during COVID. There was no measure of that in history. None, not even close. I can go back to measure, mention a few from all the books I've read. They get kind of dice, dicey over time and reread recently, but that's still, still in the system. The point is now credit is in contraction. That's a body in motion. Uh, consumer spending and issues are in contraction. Housing markets in contraction. Mortgage yeah. rates and housing affordability is collapsing. Um, it's the most expensive ever by some of our measures and rates are still rising. So that, to me, that's where a lot of people got it wrong. I was early. You can be wrong early or both. Get yourself out and move on. But the point is, oftentimes when you're early and you're right, when it really happens, it's worse than you initially expected. And that's where we are now. The fact that I started really calling for this great reset well over a year ago, and the fact that the Federal Reserve for this no meeting it still has its finger on the button for tightening mm -hmm. is a very scary thing. I look at that as that's the first thing that has to fall. And yes, we've had this bounce, but that's what we did in 1930. The stock dropped 50% to the low. 29, it rallied 50% to the high in 1930, and it all rolled over. I see parallels now to that. And you mentioned uh, producer price index that it's gone negative year over year. What other macro indicators and leading indicators are you following to build that deflationary case? Uh, what don't I follow? Let's look at, okay, the world's the most significant measure of heat, electricity, and fertilizer in both our countries, the U.S. and Canada, is natural gas. It went to 10, dropped to 2. If right now it's hovering around two and a half. That dropped 80%. It's the same price as 1990. If that's not deflation, I don't know what is. Crude oil. Crude oil is an enduring bear market. The peak in crude oil, let's, let's all talk of commodities, I guess, a little bit. Those are very, showing signs of what people do. A, a great Canadian pointed out in the book, The, the Price of Tomorrow, Jeff Booth. Is, we're so in such a de deflationary environment. Commodities are leading that. They show it. Crude oil peaked in 2008 around 145. Mm -hmm. It bounced to a high around 130 this last year. That's a lower high. It's made three lower lows since. That's a bear market. So there's some deflationary forces from commodities. I pointed out PPI. You look at housing, it's just starting to roll over. But it's also, Ryan, it's the base effect. It always happens. When you have an asset, that, let's say a home, that goes from 400 to a thousand okay mm -hmm. that's pretty significant inflation owner's equivalent when it jumps up above that and you hang about a thousand when it drops in a normal reversion to maybe say 800 it's deflating from that peak that's what we're doing we're just starting that now way mm -hmm. early days but the bottom line for this is money money supply in the u.s jumped the most ever and it's now it's negative it's never the money supply really didn't matter i remember when i first started in the trading pits that money supply number used to watch now you don't really mm -hmm. care about it anymore but it matters when it moves that extreme 
biggest pump ever in money supply. The year over year was 26%. The period from the beginning of 2000, 2002 was around 40%. And now it's negative. So all the money, money is showing negative. And then here's another significant deflationary force. Look at the rest of the world's currencies. The US two-year note is around 5%. If you look at the next three top countries, China, Japan, Germany, their average two note yield is a fraction. It's actually the U.S. yield is about 2.5 times that weighted number. That's a mm. deflationary force for U.S. It's, it's a significant um, force for a stronger dollar and weakening other currencies. So um, it's just getting started. The bottom line for all the inflation deflation is money, um, money supply. It's mm -hmm. negative at the moment. Okay. And a lot of people with oil spiking, a lot of uh, very smart individuals as well are saying that inflation is going to have a resurgence because oil is it bottomed and now it's in a new bull cycle. And with supply being as tight as it is and demand not um, falling off as expected, that's going to drag CPI higher, which is then going to keep rates higher for longer. And the two years is going to go even higher as the Fed continues to tighten. What's your thoughts around that? Ignore people who are bullish crude oil. It's the same price now as 2007. Be careful. Crude oil is a pendulum swinging market. You're supposed to, the opposite equities. Never, it's, it doesn't, the opposite in crude oil. In, you ever hear the mantra, you, you want to, um, it's going to go up because it went up. Crude oil is the opposite. It's going to go down because it went up. That's a fact of crude oil. So the price right now at 87 WTI is a bit rich. I think it's near the upper in the range. And I fully expect it's going to head towards 40. And a normal global recession here in fresh, in just a normal U.S. recession. We already have recession kicking in, in Europe, and they're still raising rates. We have significant deterioration of economic data out of, of China, China, and they're cutting rates to help. But remember what's happening with supply. It's one entity, OPEC. In North America, supply is massive. <laughs> it's just, let's give you examples. Um, the main reason that crude oil right now on the screens is first traded in 2007, the average price this year is 76. Okay, so it's a little bit above, above that now. That price was first traded in 2007. Show you a bull market commodities. The average this year in gold is 1933. I love that year. I can get into that later. It's the highest ever. There's a bull market. Crude oil is making lower lows and lower highs since 2008. Last year is a bounce. It's hovering around here, and I fully expect it's going to start rolling over. So here's supply. OPEC is 10, 20 years ago was 40% of global supply. Now they're 30% and trickling lower. Okay, maybe with Russia in there as part of it. Russia is a direct connection to China now. The key fact is what's happening in North America, excess of supply over um, demand. Liquid fuel production in North America, US and Canada is around 28 million barrels a day. It's been going from lower right to up, up lower left to upper right for at least 20 years. Massive supply. You know what demand is? It's trickling around 22 million barrels a day and it's been heading lower. Now it's actually tickling lower fast. Mm -hmm. So that's been the major paradigm shift in crude oil in the last 20 years. The U.S. going from the largest net importer to a net exporter and the largest net exporter of LNG, liquefied natural gas. And how did that happen? Harnessing technology. Number one, efficiency on the demand side. Peak consumption in this country was almost 20 years ago, including Canada. And let's look at some facts of recently, digging into the more normal stuff. Um, so that's supply. Let's look at demand side. Total global sales of motor vehicles now, I'm sorry, uh, passenger vehicles, 15% are EVs or EV related, according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Before COVID, it was 3%. What happened with this war when that trigger started with the war? It triggered a reason like, oh, okay, we're not going to want fossil fuels and dicey sources. We have the technology now. Jeff Booth, The Price of Tomorrow. I encourage people to look at that. Superabundance is another book. I like people to look at if, you, if you're bullish commodities. Um, and also, let's look at um, unleaded gas demand in this country is 5% below where it was before COVID. Those trends are accelerating. Now, another thing is I come from a farm background. I used to own a farm. I was out there a few weeks ago. And 40% um, of the corn crop, approximately a little bit less, goes for ethanol. Yet the ethanol demand is declining. Why? Because EVs, it means demand for, you know, copper and silver and more metals, for petroleum and crude oil. And we can, re I like to hear, I'll end with this. Anything you can grow in commodities, you don't want to be bullish. And you never want to be bullish long term. I can give you the 
price of corn first spiked around four bucks and 73, 74, I think, and it's closing on four bucks now. Right. Um, Cause you can grow it and we can grow more every day. And we grow petroleum in this country and your country, we grow petroleum through ethanol. And that just, here's something unique about that. Before the automobile proliferated as a main form of transportation in the twenties, we grew a lot of our land was used for transportation for feeding horses. So is there anything that you could see in the markets here, Mike, that would change your stance from your deflationary outlook to maybe an inflationary and we're entering a secular inflation decade with higher commodities leading the way? Yes, the same thing that produced the last inflation to accelerate, that is massive liquidity pumping in the system. And right now it's still dumping fast. So I look at it as a bridge at a time. What's happening is normal reversion of a big pump of liquidity. Also, we did something we never did before. We completely shut down mm-hmm. economies and just threw money at it. Okay, so we're completely reverting that now. We're going back to a normality, but you need the number one rule of reason for inflation in terms of fiat currencies that are have an unlimited supply is if you mm-hmm. create supply of that, everything will go up in price. That's just basics. I like to point out the price of crude oil right now at 0.042 of an ounce of gold is the same price as 1933. So if you price things in terms of something that has limited supply like gold and you don't just throw more supply at it, it'll say stable price or decline over time. And I look at the U.S., the, the Bloomberg Agriculture Index, completely declining for the last 30 years if you divide by the price of gold. Why? Because we can create more agriculture every day. Um, and we do on a global basis. Yes, there's bumps in the road and it might last a couple of years. But the mm-hmm. only way, I think, to get sustain inflation is to do what we did in the 70s and then do again what we did just print massive money and throw more money it's it's just the simple rules of it inflation is a monetary phenomenon always just look at some countries like venezuela and argentina and turkey and um it's it's always about the the money that's print money printer money printer go burr yeah and i'm almost embarrassed to ask this question but can you define what Milton Friedman meant by inflation is always a monetary phenomenon. And can you break that down for myself? Yeah. So if you, um, I like to use the example that my father first taught me and they bought their first house in Chicago. I think they paid $18,000 for it um, and then sold it for maybe 180,000, 20 years later. Is that house 10 times better? No, it's just the amount of dollars floating in the system with that much more supply is such more more inflation in the system here's another mm-hmm. good example i heard something people use recently when i had to park my car in uh, miami beach last week and they wanted to charge me 43 dollars it's a flat fee and i got out of it um in a, in a hotel and I, a year ago uh, two three years ago that was 20 dollars. did they did the value of that parking improve no there's only one thing that changed <laughs> the amount of dollars floating around inflation is always about macroinflation. I mean, there can be microinflation mm-hmm. in certain certain things in supply and demand, but macroinflation is almost always the amount of supply, the fiat currency, things are denominated in. We use dollars, the global uses dollar. Why? Because it's the best form way to do it. But if you price things in gold, you can look at the price of the stock market. The S&P 500 is about the same as 1964. Price of an acre of Farmland in Ohio is about the same price as 30 years ago, I think. Yes, the difference is you have returns from that stock market, but the actual index, you don't include the dividends, is still the same price. What's inflating? It's just you have to keep up with the inflating dollar. But right now, the fact is we are in a deflating monetary environment. M2, money supply, is declining. The Federal Reserve rate at peak, the upper round at 5.5% is above CPI. It's above PPI. It's above PPI core. It's above... Um, employment cost index, um, personal consumption expenditures, all those measures that are still sticky, but the fact that the rate uh, you can in the U.S. dollar earned by a deposit is well above that is deflationary. And the money supply is negative. It's creating that mag- negative pressure on inflation. Actually, it's reversion. That's all it is. It's just reverting for an extreme. And what is your outlook for the U.S. economy over the next 12 months? Our economics team, that's the thing I, I like. I can depend on all my colleagues have independent views we don't have our view we have each of our own views and we're not sell side we're not buy side we're just these are our views which is one thing i love about bloomberg intelligence obviously a bit of a pitch but our anna, anna wong's our chief economist she, her model showed inflate a recession starting a year ago um, in 12 months show supposed to start now okay but she's been early there was a good mm-hmm. reason for that to not happen we had that massive fiscal pump um, mm-hmm. in the system 
um, the, what happened with student loans, you don't have to pay them anymore. Now we have to do start paying them. So I expect within the next 12 months as we start out the program, a pretty severe recession getting started. The difference is, Ryan, from any time in the past is the Fed will not ease with the ease it has in the past. Maybe not ever until mm. it's really bad. So I think the lessons of what we did will go back to, okay, no more quantitative, if we have good leadership, no more ever quantitative easing. Me, the Fed, right, goes drops rates to one or 50 basis points in a severe recession, and then lets the system work it out. So this is what's going to be the benefit of this. We'll work, go back to the days where it's not just about every 20% correction in the stock market. I've, ne I've modeled this back to 1950, the Fed would ease. There's one the only example was 1988 because it had crashed in 87. That is over, and the market hasn't figured it out yet, but it will. Um, and to me, that's where we're going now, and we're going to revert some of the most expensive asset prices in our lifetime. So this is the problem with where we are now. That's why I'm calling this one of the greatest resets of our lifetime. Before we started this current rate cycle from zero to 5.5% on the upper bound, 5.5 and a quarter in the lower bound, um, the U.S. stock market reached the highest ever versus GDP, the Warren Buffett mm -hmm. model. It reached the highest ever versus every stock outside of the U.S., the MSCI XUS. Now, okay, that only goes back to 1980. It's the highest ever versus housing, U.S. housing. And it was the highest ever versus sales. And all the data we have, what does that tell you? The risk is revert that lower. And there was a really good reason for it. Zero interest rates was unprecedented. We've never had negative interest rates and zero interest rates for that long and a wide scales we had starting with 2009 and eight, mm -hmm. lasting until uh, 2015. In Europe, a lot of them were negative. In Japan, you saw what happened. So what does that do? It creates excessive valuation of risk assets. And what's happening now, we're in the process of reverting that when you can get 5% guaranteed about in a U.S. Two, government two-year note with inflation running lower and still heading lower, that's bad for risk assets. And I look at that as it's the giant black hole sucking sound and all assets are probably going to be heading that way. And particularly when we get this tilt towards recession, when people realize the Fed's not there to help you, like they had first for most all careers of anybody who's running money now. And so have we ever had a situation like this where it's a globally synchronized recession where a lot of major economies are still hiking into that? Or is this very unique to 2023? There you go. It's never happened. Now, I was part of the, I, I came to New York from the Chicago pits in 93. And I mm -hmm. came right during that big rate hike cycle in the 94. And that was great. It made sense. Um, but it was in a um, an organic demand pool increasing environment. Um, I, think, I forget where they went from my like three to six. I can check, but I, it doesn't matter. And then we worked through it. It was part of the internet bubble. And then, of course, that burst in um, 2000. Um, on a global basis, this is unprecedented. And for the, the pace, unprecedented. And bottom line is, I mean, it's just basically catching up to the Fed. All the banks, I mean, you have to, or your, your, your currency is going to um, implode. Now, Brazil is a little bit ahead of the game, and they got treated well for that. But that's one example. Now, some countries are starting to cut rates. Um, but what's also happening within that, Ryan, is what's happening in China. Now, I was in the trading pits when China peaked in 89 in Nikkei. Mm -hmm. I remember well when the wall went down in the Soviet Union in, in uh, the Berlin Wall in 91. And I've read Atlas Shrugged, and everything that's happening to me in China is that combination altogether. Um, China grew way too far too fast. They have, in, in, in an environment that switched from more of a peasant type community to, you know, capitalism, socialism bent, now it's almost completely autocratic, one leader. And they very ups, much upset their best clients. So this is epic, historic. And I look at it, if we don't get a normal, and if, if asset, uh, risk assets were cheap before this happened, that would be fine. But they were the most expensive ever. So it's mm -hmm. all lined up to, to be a historical reversion. And you have an option right now. You have an option. People can easily put their money in safe assets. So I think the normal human nature to take too much risk when rates are extremely low will come out the hard way when risk assets decline. Now, we've had a little blip in that, but it's almost epic historical. And then you add in the, this war, and gosh, I hope it doesn't go nuclear, but there seems to be no end in sight. But there is one who could end this right now, not, and that's Mr. Z, really. Mr. Z can flip his very autocratic, anti-capitalism, anti-West, anti-US nature. Um, and yes, that's from a yank, but it's just the opposite of ding. And that could change things, but we would need some kind of significant flip in the current trajectories, which are very 
um, kind of like what happened with Smoot Hawley Tariff Act. I mean, the economy was doing okay until 1930, early 30s, and then we shut off trade. And boom, that's what we're doing. We're shutting off trade. But what's happening is this is so bad for this engine of economic growth out of China. I mean, the world realized, okay, we don't have to ship things that far away. We can use um, 3D printing. We can, we have In the U.S., we have... Mexico, Canada, South America, we have rapidly mm -hmm. advancing technology. Um, and, and automobiles that used to have 5,000 parts now can do it with 500 parts, you know, going mm -hmm. EV. The world's changed completely. China's GDP has jumped from basically around 4 trillion to 7, almost 20 trillion really quick um, to revert just a little bit will have major repercussions. What stops it? The Fed is still hiking rates. ECB is still hiking, hiking rates. Bank of Japan might be hiking rates. Bank of um, England is hiking rates. And let's look at European PMIs are all negative and they're still hiking rates. That's just a yeah. bad combination. Something's got to give. So here, I'll end with this. Typically what's happened in the last two years when you had a bottom in the stock market came almost two years after the Fed first started easing. I expect that to, to play out, but maybe different this time because what got us what got us to where we are, never forget where you're from, is we were the richest, most expensive risk assets in history um, by many measures just um, about a year and a half ago, right before the Fed started hiking. Yeah. And where do you think this relentless bid in risk assets, where is that coming from and what's propelling that since earlier this year? I, I look at it as a bounce, like 1930. It's it's the sense. It's typical, classic human nature, Ryan. Mm -hmm. and I hear it all the time. It's the classic nature that's really worked for most of history, and certainly since the bottom in 2009, it went up. So it's gonna go up. Stock market, even in cryptos. And I like to say, well, if you haven't traded for at least, even if you've been trading money, money for about 20 years, yes, that worked. 2003 was a great bottom. 2002 was a great bottom. Massive pump of liquidity from the Federal Reserve. Went to basically zero. That's over. So I think it's the classic shift in human nature and what's worked and what's happened. As I heard someone on the call say this morning, most actuaries, most pension funds, endowments and things have these targets. They have to have 7% or so. And that never made sense. So they had mm -hmm. overweight equities. But now you can get to 2 you know, 5%. They're still underperforming. But... Um, did we expect this not to end at some point? And I think what happened with that big pump inflation with COVID shutting down the world was a classic trigger for it to end. It hasn't ended yet. You have to have little blips. You have to make it difficult. If trading were easy, I'd still have hair. I probably wouldn't be working. I enjoy working, um, depending on what I'm doing. But it can't be easy. It's a lesson I learned in markets. If it's that easy, then something's wrong. That's kind of why I'm bearish cryptos right now, because people are saying this. I don't want to diverge too much, but the CF is going to make Bitcoin go straight up. I'm like, okay, well, that's easy. So this, to me, that's the problem. And then, of course, the massive shift in fiscal versus monetary. The thing I got wrong, I never felt the Fed, I never thought the Fed would hike this much, this mm -hmm. far, and still be doing it. Why are they doing it? Because the stock market's double, kind of double dog daring them. Why is the stock market still up? Because it's sticky. Uh, we've had all this money in the system. It's still well. Fiscal is still positive. But what does that mean? Never fight the Fed. Don't fight the liquidity. It's just going to make it worse. And do you think after we get this recession and then the deflation, does inflation spike back up to, you know, four or 5% moving forward? Or do we fall back in that range pre-COVID of 2%-ish inflation? Oh, I think we're going to absolute severe deflation. That's a normal cyclical response to the biggest inflation in 40 years on the back of the biggest liquidity pump in 40 years that we end of a significant asset appreciation cycle that's now ending. Now, so far, stock market's doing great, but in a normal recession, it doesn't. And we haven't even had that pump from the liquidity from the Fed to help it do well, and you get a normal recession. One bridge at a time, I think we're going to come out of this where it's going to really prove the North American the free capital, our capitalist system, which is so imperfect, as much superior than autocratic leadership in Russia and China and the BRICS. Um, India might be somewhat excluded, but it's clearly um, autocratic leadership in the in uh, Russia, China. It's going to prove that system is just superior. We've proved that in cryptos already. But one bridge at a time. My bridge right now is to get through this next. First one is, okay, how are we going to get through this next period where the Fed's priced for tightening 
at the end of the year. And my base case is they equity start rollover following cryptos. Now we're yeah. taping this on 9-11 and Bitcoin cryptos are down three to four um, percent first um, since last Friday, which is pretty bad. Bottom line is, will we get that liquidity from the Fed? And I think it's mm-hmm. going to be delayed more so than any time in the past. And virtually every money manager on the planet hasn't seen that. So I give one example. In 1928, the Fed Reserve of New York started hiking rates because they saw the bubble. And then they started cutting rates when the Fed and the market really collapsed in the Q4 1929. They were there to help out, yet it was too late. It just went too far too fast. Virtually, I, I, and I've checked the, on a 12-month basis, every single time the S&P 500 has been down 20% since around 1950, the Fed started cutting rates. I think the Fed has taken this as an historic example on the back of this historic inflation to cut that umbilical cord. Do you think we're going to look back in five years after this is all played out and be like, oh my goodness, they did not have to hike to five and a half, six percent? Check, Ryan, I think that's exactly the way to look at it. Put yourself in the future and look back. What does history lessons tell us? Number one, were risk assets expensive to the stock market? Yes. How much? The most ever by the measures mm-hmm. I mentioned. Okay, well, that's pretty extreme. How significant is what happened? Happened. It's the most ever. How fast have they hiked rates? The fastest ever. And I didn't think they'd go much above 3%, but here we're pushing on 5.5%. They're still supposed to hike. So to me, the Fed has gone way too far. I met David Altag of the Atlanta Fed in March in Miami. We had a nice conversation with some people at the Fed who agree with you. And then he pointed out all their sticky metrics. That's the lose-lose. Their main metrics are produce, um, personal consumption expenditures, employment cost index, CPI core. They're all running around 3%. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. 4%. The goal is 2%. That's the sticky metric. They're not going to cut rates until they can really see something going down and making them cut rates. So um, I've heard a previous person say, look, cut rates when there's a credit event. What creates credit events? Lower plateau of risk assets. So I always like to pattern almost everything. I, I look at most markets like the price of gold, price of Bitcoin, copper, crude oil, stock market, everything is, what's the inflation, the expectations for the liquidity a year from now? That means putting my hand down here for a reason, so it's on the camera. Fed fund futures in one year, that F1 thing, it still shows the market expects rates around 5%. doesn't even expect that liquidity in the system. And risk assets are still expensive. Now, not as much as they were before 2022. My Gina Martin Adams, our equity strategist, his earnings are starting to improve. I'm like, okay, well, that's for a little while. Um, but bottom line is don't fight the Fed. They're still tight, heightening, hiking. They're well above um, CPI and PPI. And we were talking off camera about how you like to use Bitcoin as a leading indicator. So what are you expecting the price action to be like in Bitcoin as we go through this recession? Are you expecting another wick down lower to the 15K level or lower? And then I believe you're still macro bullish on Bitcoin, though, over the long term. Is that correct? Oh, big picture, long term. Yes. Big picture, long term. You always got to be kind of bullish the stock market long term. But it didn't, mm-hmm. you know, it took what, 13 years to take out that high in 2000. And then again in 2000 and in uh, eight, and then of course there's other one measures in history. And when you get too expensive, the the problem right now it's not so much I like to look at it. I think it is, um, mm-hmm. and because it, first of all it's indisputable. Well, there's no other risk asset in the history of mankind that trades 24/7. That's no one's project, no one's liability. You can trade it on your phone, um, mm-hmm. and um, has appreciated more than any other asset in the history of mankind. Boom. Okay. That's almost all disputable, indisputable, and is of this size and magnitude. I mean, in the U.S., when I fill up my tax forms, I have to put whether I bought, sell, or have any um, transactions in crypto cryptocurrencies. I think is what it actually says in the tra- tax form. So that's how significant it is. Um, so it's liquid. It's it's, and the problem is it's gone up so far so much. So I like to say it's up right now. It's around twenty five thousand as we tape this. It's gone up 25,000 times since it first traded one in 2011. That's, I think, 1,000 times as much as Amazon has increased from when it first started to trade, trade a dollar, um, even to now, over 25 years. Any other asset, and there's no comparison. So I look at it as, um, it's also, what's indisputable about it, it is it was the first crypto that came of age during the most historic period of zero interest rates in history bar none. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's no... Uh, it's digital asset in a world going digital. It's got all that significance. And yet, then we ended up with almost 30,000 of them on coinmarketcap.com. Massive speculation. 
the first time in history, revolution in technology, usually what happens in the process of reverting, what stops it? The key thing is 800 pound gorillas, the Federal Reserve is still tightening. So I think mm -hmm. this process of reversion is in place. I'd love to see Bitcoin break out and sustain above 30. I think it's mm -hmm. at risk of dropping below 25,000 and taking everything risk with it. So I've published on what's really happening is you look at the broad crypto market, the altcoins in the column, there, there's what, 30,000 of them? Just mm -hmm. massive speculative, they're basically speculative digital assets. Now some of them, maybe 100 are gonna matter. Certainly Ethereum's gonna matter in the future. Crypto dollars really matter. I mean, um, but the pump of the price was excessive. And we've seen that in Amazon, we've seen it at all risk assets, and I think it's still going to be the leading indicator. Um, at some point, I think it's gonna turn around and trade more like gold and treasury bonds. But I look at it right now as the bear market started with the peak in 2021. We've had a bounce this year and it's starting to roll back over. And how are you positioned, Mike, for this deflationary outcome? Well, so I don't, I'm not allowed to take many um, positions on anything I write about. And I like to give the example, if you look at the uh, U.S. government to your note at about 5%, um, I say turn off CNBC. You can guarantee if you put $100 in that U.S. government um, to you note, in mm -hmm. two years, you can get $110. It's not that complicated. I've never really seen that example in history when I think all the risk assets are that expensive. So I look at the U.S. Treasury market curve. The whole curve is um, very attractive. I think yields are going to drop in a deflation environment. That's a good place. And gold. I think gold is going to be one of the better performers. And I also like to point out um, gold, the average price this year, 1933, is the highest ever. Mm -hmm. That's a bull market. And are you expecting us to return to ZERP after this all plays out? I, that's the key thing. That's another bridge to cross, Ryan. I want to see okay. um, if my first base case happens. I hope not. I think the prudent thing to do based on the lessons of human nature, which Jeff Booth points out is just a whole different measures of error correction is, okay, well, that was probably not a good idea to go zero interest rates and to do quantitative easing. So if we really have problems, maybe we should just drop, drop rates to very low levels and let the economy work out it out organically. It might take longer, but in the big picture, it'll be better off. That is kind of what I'm hoping happens. You never know what happens with political and um, fiscal policy. And if we get proper leaders, I think that will happen. Um, of course, what do politicians do when the economy, when they need votes and they need to get elected and the economy's in recession, they pump the prime the pump. So we'll see yeah. what happens there. That's just yeah. nature. That's not going to change. But one bridge at a time, if I'm right about this, which obviously it's the base case I started a year ago and I see it more likely now than I did a year ago. The first thing for the next major issue is how, what's going to happen when we get a normal correction in the stock market, in the housing market for a typical recession in the U.S., which we have not had since 2008 near, near 09. We had a little blip, with it, but it was completely changed. We're way overdue for a normal recession with the Federal Reserve still tightening and infl inflation still declining and economy mm -hmm. rolling over, which is look at things like housing. Well, hey, Mike, it was an absolute pleasure to meet you. Thank you for making some time and coming on the show today. Where can I send the audience to learn more about yourself and uh, what you're up to over at Bloomberg Intelligence? Well, Ryan, it was my pleasure. I appreciate your questions. I appreciate the conversation. I'm on the Bloomberg Terminal first. I'm on LinkedIn, um, and I'm happy to link in with people. Just send me, a, I'm Mike McGlone at Bloomberg. Um, just send me a, a LinkedIn um, uh, link, and we'll... A hook up and I need an email and also on Twitter, Mike McGlone um, at Mike McGlone 11. Um, so I'm happy to stay in touch with people. I can give people cliff notes for your versions and so I can add them to my list, but I have to, you know, terminals first. I, I work for Bloomberg. Awesome. Awesome stuff, Mike. Well, have a great rest of your day and looking forward to talking to you in the future. Thank you. You too, Ryan.